Chapter 19, Setting Up Shop Sometimes a pile of sh** can be worth more than gold. Let's say you need to grow some food before winter. Which one's better for fertilizing the soil with? Okay, maybe that's a rude comparison. But being able to take three people off from the likely to die list and placing them on the useful list was amazingly satisfying to Jim. These three people were two advertising executives and one head of human resources. Three people who might have ended up playing Piñata Tuesday now had a whole new lease on life. The two advertising executives were husband and wife, although they worked in rival companies when they had bodies. A strange pair, Tim and Susan. Jim barely mentioned the idea for a head boy talent agency, and they were already brainstorming, ouch, bad pun, taglines. They even had a name for it, the Bucket Geezer Brigade. Jim had a feeling you could put those two in a war zone, and they'd enthusiastically come up with catchy names for the bullets flying overhead. Janice, former head of human resources for a popular soft drink company, was a bit harder to bring on board. Like many head boys, she was suffering from intense dissociation from the time in the dark and post-traumatic stress from the horror fest AZ had created in the amphitheater. Sarah to the rescue again, she found one more useful person to help, a psychologist named Laura Burns. Oddly enough, Laura suggested a solution involving Nate. It seemed one of the basic functions of the neural encasement was the regulation of the brain's chemical balance. With a few keystrokes, Janet was on virtual antipsychotics. Once she came down from her muttering and irate behavior, she was surprisingly clear and level-headed. She did request some other virtual drugs, but Laura shot down that idea as being unethical. Jim hadn't even considered all the strange things a neural encasement could do for a brain. When Nate found the file directory for the virtual drugs, the list of options were long. Some of them were outright bizarre. When this whole nightmare was over, he was going to look into that endless orgasm one. AZ allowed Jim access to a real-world printer for the flyers and forced Dave Z to handle their posting in the real world. Most of what Jim knew about Dave Z involved the times he saw him lounging around and how scared he was of Frankie. The latter seemed useful in motivating him to do less of the former. Nate set up an office simulation with desks and virtual computers to handle all the office work. AZ did add a rider, though, that if Jim was going to leave his virtual dungeon for a new office, Charlie the Shark had to come along. Ever-changing with his surroundings, Charlie was dressed up in slacks and a dress shirt that managed to stretch entirely over his muscular frame and big shark fin. AZ even gave him suspenders and a pair of wire-rimmed glasses that made the shark man look rather intellectual. Charlie exchanged his halibird for a cup of coffee, which he always seemed to pack around and occasionally sip from. You haven't lived until you've seen a shark sip coffee. Also gone were the bars, so Jim got really up close and personal with Charlie. The shark man seemed to eyeball Jim whenever he was close, occasionally even showing some teeth, but at least he didn't bite. AZ made sure to give the shark man the biggest office at the head of the floor, with big gold letters embossed on a frosted glass door that said, SHARK. When the shark man was not roaming the halls, getting coffee and intimidating Jim, it would go into its large office and sit down inside. Every once in a while, whenever Jim started to relax, it would send him an email that said, Grrr. The weirdness of AZ seemed limitless. Sarah was also part of the office staff, assisting Janice and the others as needed. Oddly enough, everyone but Jim seemed amused by the shark men. It didn't seem to respond to them in any threatening manner. It would even nod if they said hello. Janice took to talking to it. It was like some kind of bizarre office romance. For Jim, though, it was always a low growl and sharp teeth. He really hated that damn shark. To see the outside world, Jim had a picture frame on his desk that acted as the floating screen had in the other simulations. Sarah had one as well, but not the other three in the office, as they still lacked cameras with which to see the outside world. Nate found a neglected shipment of children's robots in the bowels of the ship's hull that turned out to be very useful. There were fluffy animated bears with decaying batteries and, as Nate said, smelled of mold. Half of them had been destroyed by the gang for target practice, but those that remained were full of useful parts that provided sight and sound to a neural encasement. They even provided a small screen on the belly, with a few wires and a lot of duct tape. The first of their new workforce had new eyes and ears. Nate uploaded a generic white room with bed, chair, and table into every simulation, Jim and Sarah's included. This is where everyone went who wasn't in the office or on a job. Laura the psychologist helped design the room to be minimalistic, to help the others adjust to their new lives. Nate even included an old school TV set in each room, full of old movies. 
He tried to add the TV to Jim's room, but AZ specifically said Jim didn't have time for TV. At least the movie sounded interesting when Janice talked about them to Charlie. Apparently they included Flight of Love. Instead of a TV, Jim's room contained a floating portrait of King AZ from the castle dungeon, the same one whose eyes followed him around the room. Jim didn't complain, though. Creepy as it was, at least AZ didn't make Charlie his roommate. In a mere two days, the Bucket Geezer Brigade was in business. The clever and well-illustrated flyers had two customers within hours. Janice used her workstation to transfer the head boys from their rooms into the office to explain the jobs. She did have great skill at matching people to tasks. The first two jobs were door watcher and baby monitor. Not exactly amazing jobs, but they did manage to nut the gang a few cabbages and a pile of batteries. Within five days, 53 head boys had been placed in jobs. The three doctors alone collected a great haul of useful medicine, food, and car parts for their verbal advice. Most people with medical skills packed up and headed east, looking for places that still had functional economies, so even simple examinations were in great demand. A few people with less desirable skills managed to get employment doing nothing more than keeping the elderly company. The difficult part always came down to Jim figuring out how to charge for their services. The gang always collected and traded a plethora of random items, but they usually had established markets for those items. They knew where to take those items to get what they wanted. But the things the Bucket Geezer Brigade were collecting were all over the place. It was Nate who came up with a solution. He had an idea for a series of automated lockers that would allow a single head boy to collect and release items like a store. Jim's exchange list would provide a guide, allowing anyone working to set up good trades. The driving head boys could quickly move items as needed. The only thing missing for this trade network was a means for people to see the available list of items in real time. This, though, required another visit to AZ. Nate and Jim spent some time rehearsing their sales pitch to help sell AZ on the trade network. When they phoned AZ, they weren't even sure he would hear them out at all, but instead he invited them up on the command deck in a rather friendly manner. Nate hauled Jim's case out of the workshop where most of the cases were stored, disconnecting him from the office simulation. As he hauled Jim through the halls of the rusting ship, carrying Jim so he could actually see something instead of the kid's shirt, there was wealth on display everywhere in the ship. The gang members still dressed like gutter trash, but now that gutter trash had fur collars and gold rings. One of the rooms they passed by had a full strip club in it. Nate slowed to gawk as he passed by the room, and Jim immediately took a look as well. Diane, who was in the process of getting a lap dance from a topless woman, spotted them and heaved a glass bottle at them that Nate barely managed to dodge. Another gang member nearby slammed the door shut. When Nate and Jim approached the command deck, there was a lot of banging and sawing. Jim fully expected to see a dismembered body when they entered, but instead there were several men who weren't gang members, laying down wooden floors and repainting the walls. Many of the previously rusted instruments and levers now gleamed with fresh polish. And to top it all off, a chunk of the roof had been cut open to allow room for a disco ball to be hung. AZ was busy picking colors from a series of paint samples when he spotted Nate and Jim. He threw the paint samples at the man who was waiting nearby and turned to the two. There's my favorite duo, J-Star and that kid, said AZ all bright and sunny. Nearby, resting against a wall, was Frankie. He had a single thick gold chain now, but otherwise didn't look changed at all by the wealth. He certainly didn't look any happier or more enthusiastic than he normally did. AZ, though, had pointy gold-rimmed sunglasses that appeared to be diamond-studded. He still had the fleece-lined red coat, but now his shirtless chest was adorned with nearly a dozen gold chains and jeweled medallions. It looked like he robbed a pirate ship or maybe a few rappers. AZ, sir, we have a proposal for you, said Jim as loudly as he could over the pounding and sawing all around them. What? replied AZ over the loud din. I said we have a proposal, started Jim. Speak up, demanded AZ as he closed in on Jim and Nate, holding a hand to his ear. I said we have a, started Jim again. But then AZ cut him off, turned around in fury and roared, Everyone shut the hell up! His voice blasted the noisy room, and instantly everyone stopped what they were doing. The only person who didn't look ready to run for their lives was Frankie, who didn't even raise an eyebrow. Then AZ straightened up, brushed back his red hair in a relaxed manner and said, Okay, everyone take five. I need to talk to Jay Star here. Everyone but Jim, Nate, and Frankie quickly slunk out of the room as fast as they could. Whomever these workers were, they seemed to know full well the danger AZ presented. AZ then turned back to Jim and Nate and said, So you two wanted to speak to me? 
Jim wasn't certain if AZ was still mad at the workers or him, but AZ's murderous smile returned. We're here today to ask you if you might consider, if it's okay if... Started Jim as his carefully planned speech began to slide out of his head. Come on, J-Star, out with it, said AZ. We just wanted to ask, said Nate, who tried to jump in to help Jim. But then AZ reached down and thumped Nate in the head. Not you, squirt. I want to hear it from J-Star, said AZ. Then he leaned down and in on Jim's encasement, filling the floating screen inside Jim's simulation with his crazy eyes. We want to set up a trade network, blurted out Jim. He said it so fast he wasn't too sure it fully made sense. AZ looked in through the little screen on the case. It was sort of like Godzilla looking in on a single man in a skyscraper. Jim turned away from the screen, barely looking back with one eye, clinched up, and readied for some terrible response. From the shaking of the screen, he was certain Nate was doing so as well. Then AZ smiled. Sure, J-Star. Sounds like a great idea. Get to it. Make Daddy richer. These renovations won't pay for themselves. Cheerfully, said AZ. Then he turned away. We'll need to use and expand the gang's communication network, said Nate nervously. Sure, sure, whatever, said AZ as he waved his hand over his shoulder. Hey, Frankie, go find a few slackers to help J-Star out. I'm tired of so many of them laying around my ship. I need to get that work crew back in here. I've got another idea for the floors. Wings around a big red eye in the center. It's going to be glorious, said AZ as he wandered off and gestured at the walls. Frankie groaned, walked to the hallway back into the ship, and beckoned Nate to follow. As usual, Frankie didn't look happy or angry, just completely apathetic. As Nate followed him, Jim felt dangerously close to thinking things were looking up. Somewhere in the back of his mind, though, he could feel the other shoe ready to drop.